Manos, The Hands of Fate is a film universally recognised as being terrible because, well, every aspect of the film is awful. This includes, and is not limited to, the direction, the editing, the sound, the writing, the acting, the cinematography. The list goes on. Though evidently true, this judgement is unfair. And today I'm going to make the case for why Manos, The Hands of Fate, is actually brilliant. First of all, what is this movie? Well, Manos, The Hands of Fate, is a 1966 horror, in quotes, movie, in quotes, um, from writer, director Harold P. Warren, who has done well, nothing else, really. He attempted to make a sequel, pitched another script called Wild Desert Bikers. Uh, that failed as well. Tried to turn that into a book called Satan Rides a Bike, which sounds great. Couldn't get that published. In fact, if you check the internet, Harold is most often referred to as a fertiliser salesman rather than a filmmaker. I like to think that's because he made a movie that was a bit, well, you know what fertiliser is. Anyway, back to the movie itself. Um, The plot, if it can be called a plot, a family, mother, father, daughter, driving down some road, get lost, find themselves in this creepy house with Torgo, the strange manservant who worships some master, and it goes horror movie-y. I won't spoil it. You need to watch it. The poster just describes the film as shocking, accurate, um, and says a cult of weird, horrible people who gather beautiful women only to deface them with a burning hand, which is not really what the film is about, but it's not not what the film is about, and that's important. So why do people hate it? Well, it gained fame for being in MST3K, but people hate it because they perceive it to be terrible. Let's take this scene, for example. Notice the terrible filmmaking, the nonsensical editing, terrible choice of shots. However, What happens if we suddenly put it in black and white and flash up some nonsensical French sentences every now and then? Suddenly, we have a Jean-Luc Godard movie. So people praise the hell out of Breathless and the films that followed in its wake with their strange improvisational editing, experimental style. Yeah, Man Lost the Hands of Fate. Bad movie, I'm saying that's a double standard. And, you know... When Alan Resne makes a film that's elliptical, strange, repetitive, seems to have no function, we call it a masterpiece. Oh, we loved last year at Marion Bad. When Harold P. Warren makes a film that is repetitive, strange, elliptical, nonsensical, it's trash. Oh, I hear what you're saying. It's the intentionality of these French New Wave films that make them the masterpieces they are. This is just randomness. This is just nonsense. Well, prepare to be astonished by my argument for the thematic purity of Manos, The Hands of Fate. We start with the title, Manos, The Hands of Fate. What a strange title, and as MST3K pointed out, Manos being in quotes is strange, but it separates the subtitle, The Hands of Fate. On a surface viewing of Manos, it's easy to note there are hands all over the place. It's a very handsy movie. There are hands on his coat, hands on his staff. Everyone has hands, notably. However, the hands of fate has a deeper meaning. Ultimately, Manos, the hands of fate, is a nihilistic film about how all life is ruled by the hands of fate, how we have to conform to meaninglessness, which is why the film is so nonsensical. It's all about meaninglessness. Fundamentally, Manos the Hands of Fate is a brave match of form and content. Now, you may say it's repetitive, boring, doesn't make any sense, is technically very short, but feels like one of the longest movies ever made, and I say, isn't that life? And furthermore, I say, isn't that all intentional? The elasticity of time is fascinating, the way that the same amount of time can feel arduously long or go past in a flash. That time is subjective, even though it is objective to the world around. And we experience this with cinema a lot. It's why Robert Altman's Nashville, though two hours and 40 minutes long, just slips away in brilliance, keeping you completely compelled, yet don't go in the woods from 1981, an abysmal horror movie, though an hour and 20 minutes feels like the longest thing ever made. The subjectivity of time passively affects film, but Manos, The Hands of Fate, 
deals with it directly. I mean, the movie is an hour and ten minutes long, but it feels at least twelve times that. But here is where I cite intentionality. The fact that every shot goes on for way too long. You're like, why are we still in this scene? This scene should have, well, maybe not been in the film. It certainly doesn't seem like it needs to be this unnecessarily long. It's like playing an adventure game that makes you walk all the way to the side of the screen, as opposed to just skipping to it. You know what? Man of the Hands of Fate is going to make you watch that man get dragged for a long time, in a way that is not really linked to the plot at all. You're just going to watch it, and it's just going to happen. But it's not just the shots that go on forever. There is this central fight scene which just goes on forever. There is this recurring motif of police officers who do nothing, yet keep coming back and keep coming back. And every time they come back, they seem to accost this same couple who are just kissing. And the film covers an entire night. And who knows how long, because it's very hard to keep track of the narrative. And every time this couple are kissing, nothing beyond that, they just kiss. The insufferable repetition of existence going on and on and on. All the intentional repetition in this movie about how it's all completely meaningless. But for my coup de grace, I'm going to make the point that Man of the Hands of Fate is The Shining. And it not only came out before the film The Shining, it came out before the book The Shining. I'm going to argue that Man of the Hands of Fate was probably a big inspiration on Stephen King. Which is probably why he doesn't like the Stanley Kubrick movie, because it doesn't really show its debts to Man of the Hands of Fate. And it's probably why he likes Dr. Sleep because that movie's not very good, much like Manos the Hands of Fate. So, both films start with a drought drive to the central location, and before getting to the central location, establish family dynamics and some trauma to be dealt with later. A bit more overtly in The Shining, I admit, but you know, there's some of that stuff in Manos. The majority of both films, though, are these central locations, which are characters of each film. The Overlook Hotel is The Shining, in the same way the weird shack is Manos the Hands of Fate. That's not the only thing they have in common. They are both ostensibly hospitality locations. The family in Manos stay in this place. The family in The Shining stay in the Overlook, and they are both assaulted by the strange and the supernatural. Now if you've read a lot around The Shining or watched a lot of essays on it, then you'll see people talk about the really creative use of impossible space. The geography of the Overlook Hotel not actually making sense, how there's that amazing shot where Danny goes all the way round the Overlook Hotel, or round one story of it, and if you think about it, the lefts and the rights he takes are impossible, it shows that the location can't exist. And in The Shining, because it's Stanley Kubrick, that's art, that's atmosphere, and I agree it is, it adds to the ethereal horror tone of the film. But let's not forget, it's the same in Manos the Hands of Fate. The geography of Manos the Hands of Fate makes no sense at all, I mean, you see the entire building from outside, and then you're in the building, doors seem to lead to different places at different points, you're inside, you're outside, there's some ritual chamber, then there's some sand, then there's not some sand, they left through that door, through that door's the way out, through that door's now just a bedroom. The geography of the film makes no sense at all, and everyone goes, oh, this film's terrible, but you know what? Again, it's atmosphere, it's intentionality, it's thematics, it's The Shining. And I hear what you're saying, an opening sequence that's tenuously connected, bad set design, these don't make it The Shining, but here we have the real cherry on top of the cake. Both films have the same ending. Again, dealing with this theme to go back to the insufferable cyclicality of existence, the repetitive strain of living. This is a nihilistic movie in a way that I don't agree with, but I appreciate digging into its thematics. Now, spoilers for The Shining, but you get to the film and you realise that Jack has this eternal role and the film is cyclical. These things will happen again and repeat. Now, there's a strange caretaker in Manos, the Hands of Fate, Torgo. And then when we get to the end of Manos, the Hands of Fate again, spoilers, and I apologise because I'm ruining quite the reveal here, our surviving patriarch takes on the Torgo role. The cycle begins again. Nothing is changed. The insufferable banality of existence continues. The nihilism is established, and if that isn't a powerful ending, I don't know what is. And when The Shining ripped that off, I don't know why people weren't taking to the streets. So there you go. Manos, The Hands of Fate. Not just a repetitive, poorly edited mess, it's French New Wave. Not just 
completely nonsensical and weirdly repetitive. It's it's The Shining. It's art house horror before its time. The 60s was an experimental time for Hollywood. If this film was made in France, this would be a classic. The Shining just needed those extra years, or as I'm now going to call it, The Shining, The Hands of Fate. <laughs>